Next up, I want to introduce our first keynote speaker. It is Sarah Walker Betcher. She is the author of the book, Technically Wrong, Sexist Apps, Biased Algorithms, and Other Threats of Toxic Technology. So she'll be presenting on the topic of building an inclusive design practice. Um, and also, I just want to let you know, she, her book will be available for sale in the lobby um, after the, when the first break happens at 10 o'clock. And she'll be signing her book at the breakouts at, at 10 a.m. and at lunch. So please welcome Sarah Walker Betcher. Hello, good morning. Nice to see you all. So yes, building an inclusive design culture and inclusive design practice and why we need so desperately to do that as we're talking about things like health experience and technology. To start out, I'd like to talk about something that happened last fall that I think relates to health a good bit. And that is an update that happened at Google Maps. So Google Maps launched this new product feature to a bunch of its iPhone users. And what the feature did is that in addition to the normal stuff you might expect from Google Maps, like being able to track from point A to point B via car or walking or transit, what Google Maps started doing was also telling you the number of calories they thought you might burn if you chose to walk instead of taking another form of transit. In addition to those calories, they also decided that what you really needed was to know how many mini cupcakes that might be. Now, this launched one day in October, and pretty quickly some people started talking about it, and one of them, my favorite, was this woman, Taylor Lawrence, who's a journalist. And so I just want to walk through the experience she had that evening. So around 8 o'clock p.m., she sees this update on her phone. She's like, whoa, what is going on? What is this, right? And pretty quickly, she starts identifying some issues with it. So she starts out with just kind of noting that it's happening. And then as she goes through the evening, she starts talking about how there's no way to turn this feature off. She had not opted in. She could not opt out. She talks about it being potentially really triggering to somebody who has an eating disorder. She mentions that it could be seen as just really shaming. She talks about all of these different reasons that this product feature might not work very well. She asks, like, why are we talking about counting calories? That's not even necessarily an agreed upon thing we should be doing. She talks about why is this a cupcake? That is a very weird food choice. She talks about all of these ways that this sort of perpetuates a sense of diet culture, and on and on, right? This goes on for about an hour until around 9 o'clock that evening. So to recap, these are all the challenges that she finds with this product. There's no way to turn it off. It's dangerous for people with eating disorders, shaming, that average calorie counts are totally inaccurate, calories are not created equal, a cupcake's not a useful metric, a cupcake is not a neutral food. Like, when you think about a pink cupcake, that is a very feminized food. It sort of has a lot of middle class connotation. It's very white. So like, this is not, you know, an average food, whatever that means, right? And the perpetuation of diet culture. Now, you could agree or disagree with any of these individual critiques. You could say, actually, I'd really like that calorie count feature. But what I want to point out here that I think is really important is that it took her one hour to come up with this list of reasons that this product feature could be really harmful for people, right? In an hour. Now, within three hours, Google took the feature down. I have worked on some projects. How long do you think they spent building that? It was definitely more than three hours because I know from my personal experience that you can argue over like the color of the frosting in the illustration of the cupcake for more than three hours. And I love this story because I think it's such a perfect encapsulation of all of these tiny little ways that we make everyday choices in the products we build and the features we build and the things we prioritize and the copy we write and all of these little spaces that can end up actually harming people or end up excluding people without us really realizing it. And without us necessarily stopping and asking, should we be doing this at all? And particularly as our work intersects with people's health, we start making a lot of wild assumptions in these choices that we're making about what we know about their health and what they need. So there's a lot of small choices that I see every day. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those choices I see in things like interfaces. Take, for example, this email that my friend Dan Hahn received from his scale. So Dan has a smart scale, but you'll notice this email is not addressed to Dan, it is addressed to somebody named Calvin. Don't be discouraged by last week's results. We believe in you. Let's set a weight goal to help inspire you to shed those extra pounds. You may also notice that Calvin's average weight is 29.2 pounds. Calvin would be Dan's son, he's a toddler. And every week he weighs more. 
And the scale didn't get it. The scale didn't understand, right? Like the, this product had been designed with one goal in mind, and that goal was weight loss. And the idea that weight loss was a thing to celebrate and weight gain was a thing to be concerned about was the only, only story that it knew. And in fact, it wasn't just his son that got a message. This is the message that his wife received. Push notification on her phone. Now, she'd happened to have just had a baby. So I guess, con congratulations. But there are so many reasons why congratulating somebody on hitting a new low weight may not be a good thing. Like, that might be a good thing for you if that was your goal, right? But I know people who, you know, we talked about eating disorders before. I know people with eating disorders, and they certainly have spent a lot of time trying to retrain themselves to not look at hitting a new low weight as something to be a congratulatory event, right? But I also know people have things like chronic illnesses where when they lose weight, that is actually the first sign that they are getting sick. And this kind of like small thing, it happens so many places and sometimes it's just these throwaway bits of copy. This is from a period tracking app. I love talking about period trackers because we embed a lot of extremely narrow thinking about culture and people into period trackers. And so um, this period tracking app cycles has a feature, and a lot of them do, where you can let a partner know what's going on with your cycle. And so you can like invite your partner to have access to your data effectively, right? So this copy here, right? Keep him in the loop, just for you and him. It assumes a lot of things about who that person is that you are keeping in the loop about your cycle, right? It assumes that you're in a heteronormative relationship. It assumes that people who are in other types of relationships wouldn't use the period tracker. And probably the people who wrote this never thought about it that way. They were never trying to leave out people who, let's say, had a partner who was also a woman. Um, but that slipped right by because nobody was paying enough attention because their assumptions about who's using this and why they're using it were really limited. You see it all over the place. This is one from a, um, a company called Glow that used to be marketed as just a period tracker and at this point still was, um, has now morphed into a few other different things. But what they started talking about was choosing your journey and then they would give you these three options. Are you avoiding pregnancy? Are you trying to conceive? Or are you under fertility treatments? Those were the three categories they decided that people who wanted to track periods fell into does not actually include people who want to track periods for other health reasons besides getting pregnant or not getting pregnant, does not include people who are in relationships with people who can't get them pregnant, does not include people who cannot actually get pregnant because they're infertile but they still have a period. There's a lot of reasons somebody might want to use a product that makes them not fit into these categories. And oftentimes what we end up doing is we take our own biases, our own assumptions about how the world looks and how the world is, and we can embed them right into technology. And so a question that I want to ask is, when we do this, whose health are we actually designing for? It's not everybody's. And the thing is, this kind of design problem, these kinds of small issues that we have and the things that we design, they can make their way into some pretty deep places where they can cause a tremendous amount of harm to people. For example, this is a woman named Tammy Dobbs. She lives in Arkansas, and she has cerebral palsy. And so she receives in-home care under a Medicaid waiver program, and she needs that care to help with all kinds of things, everything from getting into and out of bed, she can't do that unless somebody is there to help her, to you know, bathing, to daily household tasks. And when she was first assessed for her in-home care, she received the maximum that was allowed in the state of Arkansas, 56 hours a week. So it's like an eight-hour day, seven days a week. That was until 2016. In 2016, uh, Arkansas started using software that was based on an algorithm that would determine the number of hours of care she would receive. And all of a sudden, nurse came in, same thing, walked through all the assessment questions, tons and tons of questions, except the numbers came back different. This time she was cut to 32 hours a week. And it was devastating for her. And it was devastating for her particularly because there had been no change to her health. This was somebody who's never going to get better. And so some folks started looking into what was going on with this software, right? And what they found was that there was really a small number of variables that could have this dramatic effect on where somebody landed in terms of their amount of care allotment. A difference, for example, if somebody gave you, the person assessing you, gave you a three or a four on a particular category could change dozens of hours of care. The other thing that was really problematic was that they were asking a lot of questions when they were going in to talk to people about how they were doing, right? 
They're asking a lot of questions, but there were actually only 60 facets that were used in the algorithm. It was far fewer. And those were the ones that were being used to decide what kind of care you would get. The algorithm would put you into these categories and run you through this kind of flowchart-like process, and you would end up in a category that could have a, like to put some bounds around your care. And if you ended up in the wrong category, a different category than you had been in before, that could really change the situation. And there were all kinds of problems. For example, there was a case where um, somebody came in to do an assessment, and the person that they were assessing was an amputee. So they reported that this person did not have any foot problems. Their care was cut. Which, I mean, if there's some logic to why they put that down on the piece of paper, right? Like, I don't know, how do you answer that question? But the computer doesn't understand that. The algorithm doesn't care. So something I really want to point out about this is how the people who are having to interact with the software see it. These people who are trying to use the software to do their jobs. The nurses kept saying things like, it's not me, it's the computer. And that's the thing, the more that so much of our society has interacting with like machine learning and interacting with algorithms and so much of healthcare is doing that, what we end up having is these systems that are very opaque. It is hard to understand how the decisions are being made, why they're being made. There are so many factors involved that if you understand the general idea, you still don't necessarily understand all the nuances of how all those different pieces are weighted and how it spits out an answer at the end. And so it's difficult to understand. The nurses can't explain it back to the patients. And it makes it really hard to appeal because you have to say somehow that the computer got it wrong. And for most people, that's not something that they know how to do. And in fact, the people who made this algorithm, they even admitted in a lawsuit that they didn't really understand exactly how it worked, or they couldn't walk through some of the decisions that it had made and actually back up why they had made those decisions, because they just didn't know. So as we're building these kinds of opaque systems that interact with healthcare, interact with people's lives, I think one of the big problems that we end up with is that those of us who are designing technology, we can get really alienated from the people we are meant to be serving. In fact, these kinds of systems encourage us to be alienated from the people that we are serving. This is a quote, this is a quote that uh, Brant Fries, who is the president of a group called InterRAI, which is actually uh, a collaboration of, of different researchers um, under a nonprofit that built this algorithm and then licensed it to, to software companies. So this is somebody who's behind the algorithm, this is somebody who made this thing, right? This is a quote that he actually said out loud to a journalist. There are always people at the margin who are going to be problematic. And I want you to think about that for a second. Like this is a, this is a situation where somebody has become so alienated from those people that, that he's meant to be serving that he's thinking that this is people at the margin who are problems. And I want you to look at her again. This is Tammy. Think about that. I think we get into a really difficult place when we start referring to people as problems. She's a human. And not only that, it's not just that she's a person at the margins, it's not just that she's an edge case, she's what I would call a stress case. Meaning that we need to understand where the system doesn't work for people, we need to understand who we have left out or who we haven't thought about, what assumptions have we baked into the process, just like the assumptions that could be in the cupcake, just like the assumptions that could be in the period tracking app, what assumptions are we baking into these complex systems where they become incredibly invisible and hard to track down, and who is getting pushed to the edges because of them. And this is particularly important when we start talking about things like algorithmic decision making because one of the things that we know about it is that so much of the testing that's being done on these systems is being done with narrower groups of people than the actual audience out there. Something that we've already seen in healthcare, if you know anything about things like, I don't know, most pharmaceuticals only having ever been tested on men. Um, we can get into that later. But that these, for example, a lot of things like facial recognition, those systems are going out the door saying they have like a 99% accuracy rate and then it turns out they were only tested on white guys and that they have like a 35% failure rate for, for black women, right? And it's like, we have to think hard about who are the people that we are not thinking about in our design process and what assumptions are we baking into who our products are for, what they're meant to serve. So if we want to make changes to our practice, there's a few things that I think we need to be thinking much more heavily about. And the first is about the assumptions that we're making, right? Are you familiar with the old adage, when you assume? 
This is a dad joke. This is my dad's joke. Make an ass out of you and me. But it is very true. When we make assumptions about who and what we're designing for, it says a lot about ourselves, and it doesn't say very much about our audience. For example, in this uh, scale email, there are several assumptions that you can see right off the bat if you take the time to stop and think about them, right? There's an assumption that whatever the user weighs, that they're carrying extra pounds. So you've assumed that you know that they're carrying extra pounds. There's an assumption the person is trying to lose weight, that they feel bad about having gained weight because you're giving them a reassuring pat on the back, and that they want your help. They want help from the scale to lose weight. And if any of those things are not true, that feature fails. We make so many assumptions about all kinds of things, and everybody does it. You have to make assumptions to get through your day, but we don't spend enough time taking stock of what those assumptions are. Assumptions about who people are and what they care about and what they're doing at the moment that they're interacting with your product. And we make a lot of assumptions about their goals and what they think is important in life, because we often think that what we think is important is what they should think is important. And it's just not true. We also need to be thinking a lot more closely about the practice that we have in terms of what are our processes, what are the things that we're doing, what are the habits, what are the priorities we have in our organizations that are allowing us to be more inclusive or less inclusive in our work. Because, you see, if we care about something, we will include it in our plans. We will assign resources to it, and we will evaluate against it. And if we are not willing to do those things, then what we're saying is that we just don't care that much. So I always want to talk to organizations about how do we make sure that a more inclusive design and the ethical design is an explicit, and I mean explicit because like we have to actually talk about it specifically. You can't say, we all are good people here, we're doing our best. You have to actually talk about it in very explicit terms at every single stage of your projects, right? Are you talking about the potential unintended consequences of your work at the very beginning? Do you have use cases and scenarios that handle things like people who, who would be at the edges, those people who could be stress cases that could show you where your design choices break? Are you testing your product? Are you having content or design critiques that walk through ways that this could be excluding people? Is that on everybody's radar every single time? And when you're evaluating a project success and an employee's success, are those factors coming into play again? The last point I'd like to make is that we really need to understand that actually including people can be a disruption to business as usual, and that can mean that there is an impact on metrics that we have decided matter. And we have to come to terms with that and decide that we are going to do it anyway. And I'm going to point to an example here from an organization that is not in healthcare. So I want to talk a little bit about what that actually can look like. That's Nextdoor. So Nextdoor, you might be familiar, it's a social networking service that connects you with people who are directly in your neighborhood. So if you're having a yard sale, or it's going to be street closures, or you lost a pet, you might go to Nextdoor to connect with people who are right geographically close to you. But Nextdoor was actually having some other kinds of posts that were causing them some problems. And what people were finding was that the racial profiling on Nextdoor was oftentimes, hmm, people were posting crime and safety reports with very little information except for like, Effectively, a black man drove through. A Latino was walking a dog. But people were putting that in as if suspicious activity was taking place. And this was happening over and over again. And Nextdoor was getting a lot of flack for it. And so some groups in Oakland, where Nextdoor is based, took them to task on this. And Nextdoor decided to do something about it. So what they did is they partnered with these groups in Oakland. And they started looking at, how do we improve this process? So first they did things like they would have you flag um, they would have you flag a post as being racial profiling. Then they found out people don't actually know what racial profiling is, and they would flag stuff they just didn't agree with. And so what they decided to do is they needed to um, create a process, bit by bit, as you were posting about an issue, that would actually slow people down and prevent them from posting something that was racially profiling. So what they did is they took what used to be just like, here's a big text box, put whatever you want in it, and they said, OK, we're going to slow you down and actually make you think about what you're doing. So you're going to have to ask yourself, is this really behavior that is suspicious? Then you have to describe it. Then on the next screen, you can actually talk about the people who are involved. If you try to submit a post that only shows the race of a person, you will be rejected. You have to include other information, because they don't want you to submit posts that are just based on race only. 
And what they found is that as they were testing this out in real markets, that it was reducing the number of racially profiling posts dramatically. They were saying by 75%. But I bring this example up not just because I think that that is a great improvement, but actually because there was another metric. It's really important here. They found that about 50% fewer of these forms were getting filled out. That is usually seen as a bad metric for an organization like Nextdoor, because they need daily active users. They need those views. They need people coming in and reading posts and commenting and replying. And crime and safety reports are very popular. So what they had to do is they had to make a choice. They had to decide that it was more important for them to serve people who could be harmed by their product, that it was more important for them to do what was right and inclusive than it was for them to keep those page views or keep those daily active users bumped up, right? They had to accept that they were going to take a hit on that metric that mattered to them in order to make this change. And there are a million different ways that we're going to have to make tough choices about what is important. But I think what we know is that the work that we do as we're designing experiences in healthcare or anywhere else, it's incredibly powerful. And the role that technology plays in our lives, it, in, it touches every single thing that we do. So we have to say, if we're going to have this much power, to decide how we're going to use it. Are we going to make the world a little bit safer, or a little bit more welcoming, or make our products a little bit more helpful, or a little bit more honest? And are we willing to pay the cost that that might have with it? So thank you so much for listening this morning.